Okay, so hi everybody. We are almost done with the class and we are not hosting, we're not having a lab today. Um, although I know some people are still working on the earthquakes lab and I'll have a little bit of follow up on that. But today will mostly be a, an overview and a review session for the take home final, which is due next Friday, uh, May 7th, which is the end of the term. So that is the hard deadline for completing any work this semester because mm -hmm. that's the end of the term. And after that, uh, we have, I have to submit grades. Yes? I believe on Canvas, it says it's due April 30th, which is- Oh, just I'll fix that. I'll fix that. I meant for it, to, I mean for it to be due April 7th, uh, May 7th. I thought I had already fixed that. So thank you for alerting me to that. But yes, the final is due May 7th. So um, the, so if you have, aside from the, aside from the final, if you have any other work that you haven't done yet, any labs or quizzes you haven't done yet, I will not penalize you for lateness, but get them to me before Friday, May 7th at 11.59 PM. That is unfortunately a hard deadline because I have to submit grades just a few days after that. That is the end of the semester. Um, and kind of feels like the semester has gone by fast, but I've enjoyed teaching this class and enjoyed having you, even if doing lab online is kind of a haphazard experience. Um, Aside from the seminars that I've been mentioning, there is another way to do extra credit that um, it, the it has actually been sitting in the campus site as an option for a bit, but I haven't really talked about it. I sort of mistakenly assumed that um, the so it's there's a series of USGS lectures. Um, and I had kind of assumed that those weren't available to view after they had been posted, but they are. They are there's videos of them um, linked on a website that you can access through the Canvas site. So if you go to assignments and go to the bottom to final exam, aside from the assignment that is the final exam itself, there is an assignment next to it that says USGS public lecture series extra credit. And the assignment involves this is an assignment that Dr. Bird developed previously. And I think some people have done this assignment for the lecture class. And I am fine with you. I am fine with you doing doing it for this class as well. Um, there are a series of video presentations by USGS members about different geology topics. And there is a set of instructions in the Canvas assignment for writing a two page report based on that. So it's a bit longer than the so the assignment is a bit longer and a bit more structured than the seminar write-ups that I've been mentioning as possible extra credit. Um, so as a result of that, this one will give you six points instead of three points if you are looking to add points to a lab or a um, or to a quiz. One person has done it already. I haven't added the points for that just yet, but um, I will make sure to do that soon and. The extra credit assignment, I just need those by Friday, May 7th as well, just to make sure I can add the points. Um, and Mariana, I see you're raising your hand. Go ahead. Um, it had been assumed that the lab 10 is extra credit and it's optional. Is that right or wrong? Because we found it on the webs on the canvas, but it was from 2020. So I wanted to see how accurate that was. Um, lab 10, I did not intend to be extra credit. I intended that to be a lab that you work. We'll have to do that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let me check the wording on Canvas again, just to make sure that that's um, a little more clear. But yes, lab. Right, thank um, you so much for clearing that up. Yep. Yeah, but yeah, lab ten is something I do want you to work on. I have a little bit more info on lab ten on the next couple of slides, also. Um, so for lab ten, one thing that confuse people a lot. And I also struggled with a little bit because I will be honest, I do not have that much of a geophysics background. My background is mostly working with geochemistry and with igneous rocks. Um, and I haven't done much in the way of reading seismometers in quite a while. So, um, but this thing is a headache to look at. What, what Dr. Bird told me that helps a lot is that this chart is 10 minutes across and each line kind of wraps around. For example, um, this blue line here where my cursor is, um, that is starting at um, that is starting at 1300 universal coordinated time. And as you follow that blue line across, 
you'll notice how on the bottom there's minutes listed and then there's little tick marks between the individual minutes that um, represent seconds, like, you, like these are divided into seconds. As you follow the blue line to the right side of this chart, that brings you to 1310. So that's 10 minutes past 1300 hours universal coordinated time. The next line below it is this green line. So then what you do is you go back to the left side of the chart and that green line is starting at 1310. And then you follow the green line across and that will eventually take you to 1320. So I apologize for not explaining that as well as I could have. The starting point on the starting point for when the earthquake starts shaking is um, the the earthquake starts the earthquake itself starts at 18 hours 54 minutes and 33 seconds. The earthquake is going to be felt at each station not that long after that. It's going to be a matter of seconds. And again, I apologize for for confusing people on that. Um, this. You see there's a red line here and it's it's a bit obscured by squiggling because this this blue line is below it and that's that's actually from earthquake movement also. But this red line you'll see is the one directly above um, 1100 or 1900 1100 Pacific Standard Time um, 1900 um, universal coordinated time. So this red so this red line is starting at 1050 Pacific Standard Time. And as you follow this line, you go past 1051, 1052, 1053, and the earthquake shaking starts at 1054, and 10, at 10 hours, 54 minutes, and then a number of seconds. So it's going to be, you want to look as closely as you can. You can potentially, you could use a tracing feature on, um, you could use a tracing feature on an app, or you could um, you could you could print this off and use a ruler, or you could just put a ruler on your computer screen. But you want to trace where the start of this red square, like the red up and downness, like where the where the red is really jumping up and down, where that corresponds to on the number of seconds below. And the travel time you should get for each station should be a matter of seconds. Um, so. It's going so when you subtract that, yeah, and something like something like ten fifty four forty five, yeah. So not so. Um, it's going to be again like eight to ten seconds or something like that after the after the earthquake starts. When the earthquake is felt, is going to be just a matter, of just like ten or fifteen seconds at most after the earthquake actually starts. So that should produce. So that's going to produce. Um, that's going, if you multiply that by the travel distance, that is going to produce something on the scale of 50 or 100 kilometers, not thousands of kilometers. Some people got larger, some people got larger amounts of kilometers because I, I had some issues of my own reading this and wasn't quite sure what was going on. Dr. Bird was kind enough to help clarify this and help me walk, help walk me through this. So does that make any more sense for people who might have had had trouble reading this? The blue. So we're not concerned with the blue at all. No, just the, the, red. the we're just concerned with the red line. The blue line, as the blue line, you can see is kind of starting at eleven, and that's 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 a continuation of this movement. The red line is where the movement starts. Okay, that helps. Yes, I was thinking like one was a P wave and one was an S wave, and I almost cried. I didn't know what I, what the heck I was doing. And my brain, my brain went there also. I was like, wait, is this showing separate PNS waves? And no, that's just because this, as this, this wraps around, and the blue line is the next one, and it goes to the blue line here at, um, at eleven where it's still shaking. But that's not the start of the shaking. That's just a continuation of that's the blue stuff over here where my cursor is is a continuation of this. Because you'll notice the red is kind of centered along this line. The red is centered higher than oops, sorry. The red is centered higher than the blue is. The blue is a continuation of, of the movement shown by the red. Um, and so I officially have made lab 10 due on May 7th as well. Um, so I apologize for the confusion and I apologize for um, 
for struggling a little bit with explaining this last time. Okay, uh, so I have now on um, the Mount St. Helens, do we go with the one that is at um, the eight minutes and like five, eight, yeah, like it, at the one at the eight second, eight o'clock hour, or do we go with the one that is farther in at the five minute? Eight hours and five, yeah, so there's two. There's like one that starts at eight, or nine or 10, like that it spans between eight and 9.30-ish. And then there's another, another one at 11 to 12. Yeah, give me a moment, I'll open, I'll open that file up. Okay, sorry. Not a problem. Okay, so here's the PDF that has all three of them. Um, so this is the one you're talking about? No, that's, I'm that's, Rainier. Rainier. that's the Mount Rainier. This one, this well, one. I'm on the Mount St. Helens one right now, but I could yep. be on the Mount Rainier because it also has two as well. I'm, I'm on the Mount Rainier also, so ignore this one. This is a little, ignore this one. This is the one you want. This is the one that's, okay. um, so you'll see that this is, this is, um, around the same time as the other ones, because you'll notice this is 610, or this is, excuse me, this is 1810 universal coordinated time. So this is starting around, um, this is starting, this is starting around 18, a little bit after 1850 universal coordinated time. So, th so this is the one you want. This is just a little, this is a little foreshock or a little mini earthquake that's not part of the question. So yes, this, this one is the one you want. For the math, do we use the universals? time or the Pacific Standard Time or does it matter? It shouldn't matter because you're gonna, it's gonna pop out a number of seconds either way. So it, just as long as you're consistent between the two of them. And then for the Mount Rainier, again, there's like the red above it, ignore that yep. as well. Ignore this, yes. This is, the, this is the one you want, yes. Awesome, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Happy to have cleared that up. Um, so any other questions about the reading the seism seismograph? Um, yeah, I had a question. So we could uh, redo it if we have a second chance. Yes, you can absolutely redo it. Yes, you are absolutely welcome to take another attempt on the th on it and redo it. So when you draw the three, so so when you draw the three circles around the different stations. It should produce an epicenter that's somewhere around the Olympi Olympia Tacoma area. And there's a very good chance that you're not going to get a single dot at which they all intersect. And that's okay. That doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. That's because we are simplifying a lot. For one thing, we're using a single speed through which the waves travel through the earth. And that is a broad estimate that is sort of a composite composition of the earth estimate. The fact is that earthquake waves travel at different speeds through rocks of different compositions. That is actually one method we use to study the lower parts of the crust, as well as find out what is inside the mantle. We observe how earthquake waves are refracted and how they change speeds at different points in the, in the interior of the Earth. So, the, the crust in all of this area is not all the same composition. You have a lot of volcanoes that have some have a variety of compositions. You have some that are more rhyolitic, some that are more andesitic. Then you have sedimentary rocks in the area. You have um, the Olympic Peninsula itself is this really weird geologically fascinating place. There's a lot of, there's some, there's some land there that didn't used to be attached to the mainland that has been kind of shoved onto the mainland by mountain building events. So you don't have to worry about that, but in short, it's not. It's going to make it likely that if you, that if you're just using this one speed, which, which is what we're asking you to do, then the radii around the stations are not going to intersect at a single point necessarily. Um, the other thing is that this is actually a pretty deep earthquake. Um, I was talking to Dr. Bird, and the earthquake we use in this um, 
assignment is about 50 kilometers below the Earth's surface. And that is actually on a scale that you could see on this map, hypothetically. So that's going to somewhat affect like how close the how close the epicenter is to the actual hypo to the actual hypocenter where the earthquake is occurring. Like the there's a good chance that the circles you draw are going to come close and but not necessarily meet at a single point. The convergence is going to be somewhere around here, but you might not have a single point. So that is okay. Um, I want to mention that for lab 10, there's not really that many questions about lab 10 on the final. Um, it's good to remember how you have normal and reverse faults and how normal faults occur at divergent plate boundaries. Reverse faults usually occur at convergent plate boundaries where you have where you have collision, where you have subduction creating pressure. Um, and strike slip faults usually occur at transform boundaries. Um, and that's something that is good to help you remember the different types of plate boundaries, but there aren't a lot of, there aren't really any explicit earthquake related questions related to triangulating or um, or um, measuring or looking at seismograms on the exam itself. So don't worry too much about studying that for the exam. Any more questions about the earthquakes lab? Okay, so as for the previous, as for information related to the previous lab for geologic time, the most important concept to take away is relative dating and the different rules we use for comparing the ages of rocks to one another. So you want to be aware of these principles, the principle of superposition that the rocks on the bottom are going to be oldest, um, at least with sedimentary rocks, you're just going to have them being deposited on one another and stacking so that the youngest rocks are going to pile, the, the younger sediments are going to pile on top of older sediments. You also want to remember that originally sediments are deposited in a pretty flat place. They're deposited in a basin where they will settle as opposed to rolling downhill. If you have, in this case, you have, a, you can see there's a couple of layers that are tilted and like the, um, what does that say? The list uh, Lutgrad formation, that sounds very Russian, but the Lutgrad formation here was not deposited like this. It wasn't deposited at an angle. It was originally flat when it was deposited, but tectonic forces like compression have caused folding and caused it to no longer be horizontal. So the events that cause faulting and folding happen after deposition. The rule of cross-cutting relations is that if a feature cuts across something else, that feature is younger than the something else. And that applies to that applies to intrusions of igneous rocks. Like if you have a granite blob intruding across layers of sedimentary rock, or if you have an igneous dike cutting across layers, or if you have a fault causing disruption, or in this case, even if you have like a river cutting through layers of sediment. Um, and that kind of plays into an rule that we don't really talk much about here, but lateral continuity states that if you have the same sedimentary layer on either side of, say, a canyon or a valley, that means that they were deposited this way first, and then the river that eroded that canyon came after. And then you want to remember that the clasts in a clastic sedimentary rock are going to be older than the rock itself. So here's an example of a question that could show up on the exam. In this diagram, we can say that the dike is younger than the granite and the Larsenton formation. What principle are we invoking? A, uniformitarianism, which is just this idea that the same processes that occur today have occurred in the past. B, original horizontality. C, inclusions. D, cross-cutting. Or E, superposition. So if we're saying that the dike is younger than the Larsenton and the granite, what rule are we invoking to do that? Would it be cross-cutting? Yep, precisely. Um, the dike cuts across those features we mentioned, so it is younger than those features. Exactly. So there will be some questions like this on the final. Any questions related to geologic time or dating of rocks? For metamorphic rocks, a lot of the a lot of the rock and mineral 
related questions will simply be about answering whether you think a rock is metamorphic, sedimentary, or igneous based on the appearance, based on textures, like does this, does this have, does the rock have neat layers? Does it have layers that look like they've been warped or distorted? If you have neat layers, there's a good chance it's a sedimentary rock. If it looks sort of warped or distorted, that's quite likely a metamorphic rock. If it has, um, if it has quartz and mafic minerals like biotite and pyroxene, there's a good chance that it's an igneous rock. For metamorphic rocks in particular, you want to be aware that there's different degrees of metamorphism, that some rocks are more heavily modified by heat and pressure than others. And that often results in foliation. When you have these, when you have these layers of micas and other colorful minerals forming, and especially in nice, like the really high grade metamorphic rocks, you get these very nicely separated black and white layers that are curved. Um, and that's in contrast to igneous rocks where you might have both dark and light colored minerals, but they're going to be not facing in any particular way because magma just sort of cools as this blob and there isn't any much, there isn't really much that causes the crystals to be aligned in any way as they grow. Whereas with metamorphic rocks, the pressure is usually causing some alignment. It's usually causing some squishing and causing the minerals to grow grow perpendicular to the direction of stress. Um, you want to be, you want to have on your radar what types of minerals show up in metamorphic rocks, how often the colorful minerals show up in metamorphic rocks. So this is one example of a question that could show up. The rock at the right, this is known as eclogite. It's not one we went over really, but this rock contains garnet and green minerals like epidote and ompicite, which is this green pyroxene mineral. It forms deep in the earth. What type of rock is it? A, igneous, B, sedimentary, C, metamorphic, D, not a rock, it's a mineral. Is it metamorphic? Yep, this would be a metamorphic rock because garnet and green minerals are usually something that show up in metamorphic rocks. Plus I alluded to the fact that it forms deep in the earth. And yes, sedimentary rocks form from burial also, but I was kind of hinting that this, this is a rock that forms from the heat and pressure from being buried, buried quite deeply. Does anyone have particular questions related to metamorphic rocks? I have a question about foliation. Oh, yep, I'm listening. Okay, so the thing that kept me confused, so foliation is not crystal, there's no crystals in foliation, it's um, plan, planar, planar, what do they call it? It, it does involve crystals actually. It involves crystals growing in an aligned arrangement. Is that what the planner is? The, or I can, I don't know if I'm pronouncing planar. it. Planner, yep. Yeah. You have, you have minerals growing in a planar pattern. Like you have them growing in a row. Okay. As opposed to igneous rocks where they just kind of grow facing whatever way. So non-foliated rocks are the ones without crystals. Um, non-foliated rocks still usually do have crystals. They're just not arranged. They're just not all arranged in a particular way. And you do yeah, sometimes have non-foliated metamorphic rocks. Like this actually is a metamorphic rock that isn't foliated. You can just, you can just make, an, make a guess that it's metamorphic based on the particular minerals present. Right. Okay. So that's where I've gotten, I always thought that foliation and non-foliation meant one had crystal formation and one did not, but they both can. They do, kind of in the same way that fine-grained igneous rocks still have crystals, you just can't see them very well. Uh, okay, I'm gonna have to, I'll write that down. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. Other questions about metamorphic rocks? Labs six and seven were both related to sediments and sedimentary rocks. So you want to think about the difference between chemical and physical weathering, how rocks are broken down into pieces and how also reactions with the water and air cause them to become oxidized or rust or cause, um, or cause ions from the minerals to be leached out and you get them dissolved in water. Sediments are 
eroded or removed from rocks and then transported by wind or water or sometimes glaciers and then deposited in basins where under the pressure of sediments being deposited on top of them, they will compact and lithify into sedimentary rocks. We have two types of sedimentary rocks. A lot of sedimentary rocks are clastic. They're made of physical pieces of pre-existing rocks. So they're made of either pebble-sized particles or sand-sized particles or mud size or silt-sized particles. Um, and the grain size of clastic sedimentary rocks says a lot about the speed of the water that was carrying them. Um, and also about the depositional environment. You find rocks that have sedimentary rocks that have larger clasts like conglomerate, which have pebbles in them, are from depositional environments where you had pretty fast moving water, like fast moving rivers or really stormy oceans sometimes. Some, some sediments formed at beaches have pebbles in them because you have really fast moving waves that have the energy to carry larger pieces of rock. But then a lot of beaches produce sandstones because the waves can move around sand but aren't fast enough to move around the larger pebbles. Lakes will often just have shale formed from mud because lakes tend lakes are often the water is very quiet and doesn't move very fast so the sediments moved around by lake water tend to be really tiny they tend to be silt sized mud sized particles um then you also have some chemical sedimentary rocks because the ions removed from minerals don't just go nowhere they get carried by the water and they end up in the ocean a lot of the time um, and they get precipitated out there as limestone, which is made of calcium carbonate. You'll also sometimes have the water carrying the ions ends up in lakes in deserts and those lakes will evaporate periodically and leave behind evaporite deposits like those that create rock salt or sometimes limestone as well. Limestone can form as an evaporite also. Um, so an example of a question that might show up related to sedimentary rocks is this, the largest grains in the rock to the right are A, boulder sized, B, gravel sized, C, sand sized, and D, salt sized, or E, this is not a classic sedimentary rock. And I realize there is not a scale in here, um, but this is, um, hopefully you can still get a sense of what, what the grain size is from looking at this. You want to think about if you can see individual grains at all, like shale, um, which is made of mud-sized particles, you can't really see the indi individual grains at all. What would you say, what would you say the largest grains are in this rock? Sand size? Yep, precisely. This is a sandstone. So, yep. Um, and that's the type of question you can, you can expect to see about sedimentary rocks. Does anybody have particular questions about sediments or sedimentary rocks. Yeah, I got confused though. I thought it was talking about like the size of the rock itself. Like Yeah, that's a good that's a, that's a good point. You have that's a good point. Um, a sedimentary rock has individual clasts in it that are the sand, like the sand sized particles or the pebbles in a conglomerate or in a shale, the mud sized particles, and you can't see them with the naked eye, but you can see them under a microscope. So it's not the size of the rock itself. This, we could have, we could break off, we could break off a tiny piece of this and it would be a smaller sample of the rock itself, but it would still be made of sand sized grains. This fairly large piece is made of sand sized grains. If you just lopped off this little knob that's sticking out here, you would have a smaller sample of this sandstone, but it would still be a sandstone because the individual particles making it up are still sand sized. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah. For, oh, other questions? For volcanoes and igneous rocks, what you want to think about are different types of volcanic eruptions. You have explosive eruptions like Mount St. Helens that produce ash and um, are often often produce felsic rocks because the felsic or lighter colored rocks have more silica in them and they tend to trap gases and be more sticky. 
then you have the more effusive eruptions where you just have lava flowing out of the cone. And those are often more mafic lavas that don't have as much silica in them. And that means the gas isn't trapped as much. Um, you want to think about how the color relates to composition. Darker colored igneous rocks have more iron and magnesium, and they're going to have a lot more dark colored minerals like biotite and amphibole. And the felsic rocks like the rhyolite produced at Mount St. Helens are going to be made of more felsic minerals like quartz and plagioclase feldspar. And then you want to think about how texture relates to formation, how igneous rocks where you can actually see the grains, where you can actually see the individual crystals form underground where it's warmer and the rocks have more time to cool since the surrounding rocks are honestly pretty warm. It gets warmer as you go deeper into the earth. But if magma gets erupted at the surface as lava, it's going to be in contact with the air or in some cases with water, like you have with the pillow basalts that I showed you the video of at one point. And you're going to get much finer grained rocks where you can't necessarily see the crystals. Sometimes lava may cool fast enough that no crystals have time to form at all. You're just going to get volcanic glass. And you have igneous rocks that have a glassy texture. You also have igneous rocks that have a vesicular texture where they're full of holes because there is a lot of gas in the magma and that gas is all escaping and leaving the holes behind. Or you might have a pyroclastic texture, like the rocks at Mount St. Helens look like they're sort of welded together. You have some mineral crystals and then you'll have pieces of rock in there also. You'll have these little jagged rock fragments and that's, that's from especially explosive eruptions. So here's an example. How would you describe the texture of this rock? A, aphinitic or fine grain crystals. B, phaneritic or coarse grain crystals. C, vesicular. D, pyroclastic or E, glassy. Glassy? Yep, this is a glassy rock. This is obsidian. This is from a lava that cooled very, very rapidly and didn't have time to form crystals. And crystals get bigger with more time, kind of like with plants. You want to think about them, the rocks that, the, igne the intrusive igneous rocks like granite that form underground have a lot of time for the crystals to form and thus for the crystals to get large. So questions regarding igneous rocks. So this is an example of a phaneritic or coarse grained igneous rock. This is a granite and it's coarse grained not because the crystals are necessarily gigantic, but because you can see them at all. And that's the key point. Now with minerals, you want to, with you'll, you will have access to, you will actually be able to access your um, flow charts when you're taking the exam, you're able, it's, it's, a pretty open note exam. Um, you are ab you're able to, it is fine for you to use the materials that you've been using to complete the labs. For minerals, you want to be aware of the difference between cleavage and fracture, how some minerals break systematically along flat planar surfaces, like how micas form the sheets or how um, some minerals like pyroxene form these rectangle shapes when they break or how amphiboles form more of a rhomboidal shape and how that also happens with calcite. But with calcite, you actually get three planes of cleavage. You get pieces, you get pieces broken off that have flat sides in all three dimensions. So you want to be aware that minerals have different, when, when they break apart, they'll produce different shapes and the, some minerals have more planes of cleavage and that, for example, micas just have one plane of cleavage. They break off in like these paper thin sheets. Some have two planes of cleavage. They'll, they'll have nice smooth surfaces on the sides and on the top and bottom, but then the front and back will be all rubbly. And that means that there's not a third dimension of cleavage. Whereas some minerals, if you break them apart, like calcite have nice smooth sides, top and bottom sides and front and back. 
And you want to be aware of how you use different properties to identify minerals in these flowcharts, how hardness is used to distinguish minerals, how sometimes the color is sometimes the color is helpful, not always, but sometimes, and how the color that the mineral leaves behind on the streak plate can be used. And also in some cases, how the crystals grow, like what their crystal shape is like, how that can help you identify them. And you want to make sure that you don't mix up what the crystals look like when they are nicely formed crystals with cleavage, which is what they look like when you break them. So quartz does not have cleavage. When you break quartz, it produces, I'm actually gonna jump back one slide. It actually produces sort of a curved surface like you see in the subsidian. It produces what is known as fracture, a specific type known as conchoidal fracture. But quartz crystals often look really nice because their crystal form is nice. But when you break them, they don't break along flat surfaces the way that some minerals like muscovite mica or calcite do. And speaking of calcite, that's a good special property to be aware of. Calcite is a mineral that comes up a lot. It's the main mineral in one of our sedimentary rocks, limestone. And limestone and calcite fizz when you put hydrochloric acid on them. So that's a pretty easy mineral identification for those. Um, you want to have on your radar what minerals show up more in igneous rocks. So um, some, some minerals do show up in more than one type of rock. Like you do see quartz in metamorphic rocks sometimes, but if a rock has quartz, feldspar, and then mafic minerals, and if it's growing like this, then that's probably an igneous rock. So in the example question, the black mineral in the sample to the right, which is a granite igneous rock, could be A, biotite, B, quartz, C, calcite, D, garnet, or E, calvinite. So you want to rule out which ones don't really show up in igneous rocks and which ones aren't dark. Calcite? Um, it is not calcite, in fact, because calcite generally doesn't tend to be black. It's the black minerals we're looking at here. And also calcite doesn't usually occur in igneous rocks. A? Yep, it is a biotite. Biotite is a dark colored mineral that you very often see in granite as well as gabbro and igneous rocks in general. And I didn't notice I didn't, again, it's often hard to tell apart some of the dark colored minerals, especially in a hand sample like this. I actually don't know for sure if this is necessarily biotite. I would have to take a closer look at the sample, um, but it could very well be biotite because biotite is a common mafic or dark colored mineral that you find in igneous rocks. Um, and a lot of the mineral questions are going to be quite similar to the ones you did for the minerals lab. They'll be based on pictures and videos that are built into the, into the, into the exam itself. I have a question. Um, those sheets that we had before, should we have them prepared or are they going to be like accessible prior to um, like once we access the exam? Um, Leaks to them or should we yeah. just have them already? I would. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, What I will do after this presentation is I'll put them somewhere on Canvas where they can be accessed, like a folder and under files, and I'll send an email out when I do that. That's great. Yeah, because like I, it's hard to keep track of all the labs that do have them and which ones they are. So that, that'd be really, really great. Thanks. Yep, I can do that. Any other questions about minerals? For plate tectonics, you mostly just want to be familiar with different types of plate boundaries, um, what happens at different types of convergent boundaries, how sometimes you get subduction if you have two oceanic plates or if you have ocean and continent, but how you'll also sometimes have continental collision if you have two continental plates meeting, and also knowing what hotspots are, knowing that hotspots are not a plate boundary type, it's where a volcano is erupting through the plate and the plate is moving, and but the hotspot itself largely is not. Um, so as one example here, um, in this animation, we have, two, we have two types of plate boundaries, but not the third one. Um, and these are mid-ocean ridge spreading centers. So what type of plate boundary is not visible in this animation? A, divergent plate boundaries. B, transform plate boundaries. C, convergent plate boundaries. D, hotspots, or E, fracture zones.
divergent are where you have them going apart, transform are where you have them going like this, convergent is where they're meeting head on. Is it divergent? Um, convergent? It's convergent because we have divergent here. We have seafloor spreading where we have crust going to the left and crust going to the right, so in opposite directions. And we do have transform boundaries. We do have transform boundaries connecting these segments, but we don't have any places where the plates are just meeting head on. And that would produce either subduction where one plate goes under or mountain building where they both go up. We don't have either of those scenarios happening here. Hotspots aren't a plate boundary type and neither are fracture zones. And going way back, the first lab we did was about maps. And um, the map related quest, there's a couple. So in the final exam itself, there are a couple of maps linked in there for you to download and look at. And with maps, a lot of it is knowing where to look for the information you need. So when reading a map, you always want to look at the legend for what the contour interval is, the what a particular topographic map is going to have a set contour interval. Um, all the contour lines on a particular topographic map are going to be the same elevation apart from one another. And the contour interval and scale are usually going to be down are usually going to be down here. So I'm, I'm realizing this is a bit hard to see, but an example question about a map like this, which is actually one of the maps from my Antarctic field season, is what is the scale of this map? And these are different possibilities, and uh, you would simply, you would be able to zoom it in more in the in the lab itself. But you'd simply look down here and be, oh, it's a one. The scale is one to fifty thousand. Um, and there are also some maps that have you look at rock types, and the legend and the rock types are going to be like the the different colors of the map are going to be listed in the legend also if it's a geologic map. There's going to be a chart somewhere that shows you what types of rock correspond with different colors on the map. And there might be questions about um, in the blue unit, would you expect to see, would you expect to see, um, would you expect to see rocks with biotite maybe? And then you'd look at the description for the blue unit on the map and if it says igneous rocks, then the answer would be yes. If it says Cretaceous sandstones, probably not so much because you don't find you don't necessarily find biotite in sandstones all that much. It's more of a it's more of an igneous rock forming mineral. So questions about maps. The exam is going to consist of 46 questions. They're going to be based on pictures and videos of rock samples and mineral samples, as well as some maps that you'll download once you start the exam itself. And you'll have two hours to take it. It's going to be one attempt, but you'll have two hours to take it. If you run into internet connectivity problems, let me know right away um, so that I can see what I can do. And this is going to be due on Friday, May 7th. I will set, I will fix Canvas so that it says that I thought I had done that already. I apologize for not getting to that just yet. And there will not be a formal review session next week, nor will we be doing another lab, but I will be around from 11 to 2.05 p.m. 11 a.m. to 2.05 p.m. next week on Tuesday, May 4th to answer questions and help you study and possibly and or help you work on assignments if there are any that you need assistance with. Um, so that is what I have for the presentation today. And I enjoyed teaching this class a lot, even if teaching lab online is sort of haphazard. Thank you all for being patient with me teaching at this school for the first time and working with material that I'd inherited and sort of have been also, I have more geology, I have some more geology background. So obviously, so I'm going to, so I might have an easier time picking it up, but it's still new material to me. And sometimes I will admit that I have struggled with that. And thank you all for being patient with that. So any final thoughts or questions before I shut the recording off? Okay, cool. That is it for this presentation. There won't be any formal class activities happening for the rest of this period, but I will be around to answer questions and help you with assignments if you need. And 